My name is Cecile Chang, and thanks for joining us for this month's Conversations with Dr. Jeff Levenshers, where we ask Dr. Jeff about COVID-19 and what employers can do to respond to the evolving landscape. We're also shifting our focus to think more about other items and topics that employers should have on mind. So welcome to this month's conversation. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Nice to see you. So nice to see you. All right, so we always level set with a little bit of what's going on right now, where are we with the virus? Well, you know, we're talking in, uh, we're talking in early April, and uh, this is generally a good time. Um, most of the country continues to see a decrease in cases of uh, case of COVID. Our hospitalization rates are down, you know, 75 or 80 percent over a month ago. Um, we we have far far fewer deaths certainly. Um, the the BA2 strain of Omicron is now dominant in the United States, and we're starting to see an uptick of cases, especially in the Northeast. You know, pretty much from Massachusetts down to uh, down to DC. Um, that might be what the rest of the country will face will face later. That's what we've seen in the past. Um, the good news is, even with the very high rates of BA2 infections that we that we saw in many European countries, we didn't see the kind of hospitalizations and and disruption from this strain that we saw earlier, um, and and that's probably due to the fact that there is a lot of immunity now um, between immunity from uh, from um, from vaccinations and immunity from people who've had infections recently, mm -hmm. and so hopefully we'll be able to even if there are. There will be clusters, and even if there is another wave, it will hopefully be a, sh a smaller wave. The other good thing is that um, when Omicron first came ashore, we actually had still a pretty high rate of infection from Delta in the U.S., and the rate of infection from Omicron BA1 is actually much lower now than it was then. So we're actually, um, and it's also spring, and you know many of us have an easier time spending more time outside or cracking windows. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful things will continue to be better. So cracking windows, um, it does feel like ventilation is a critical tool. I've gone into now uh, different restaurant environments where doors are wide open, windows are wide open. What are your thoughts about what we can do as individuals to help manage the environment from an, a ventilation standpoint? Yeah, well, you're right. Ventilation is really important. Ventilation has this other benefit, which is it's not really, I mean, yes, at home we can crack windows. Most of us in workplaces can't crack windows. Um, but um, it, to the extent that employers are able to improve the quality of indoor air, that actually helps everybody. It doesn't require anybody put on a mask have the mask fit properly, take the mask off their chin and over, put it over their nose and their mouth. Um, it's, a, it's an environmental, um, yeah, it's, it's an environmental uh, action and it just, it just gives benefit to everybody. So there's a recent study out of Italy, more than 10,000 classrooms that showed that um, by increasing uh, air exchanges by a factor of six or eight, you can decrease the number of COVID cases by a, by a similar amount. So uh, clearly increasing the amount of outdoor air that's coming in can be done often at very, very low cost, having better filters, sometimes using ultraviolet light to do disinfection too, can really make a big difference. And I think that one other point is that when employers are doing this, they should be careful to tell their employees they're doing it. Um, it's not like, you know, when there's better ventilation, you feel like you're in a wind tunnel and you know it. Uh, yeah. most, pe most people won't know. So communicating uh, the work, that, the good work that employers are doing to keep their employees safe is also, uh, is also really important. That's a good point. Communication has always been a key tenet throughout the past couple of years. Yes. Um, you talked about um, the immune levels of different populations. And very recently, I think just this past week, the FDA and CDC approved the fourth dose for yes. adults over the age of 50 plus. So what does this mean um, for us? And then what do you foresee happening in the near future with respect to expansion of that fourth dose? So it's really a second booster shot. So for some people, for adults who are immunocompromised, this might actually be a fifth dose. And the CDC and the FDA approved these, but they didn't strongly recommend them. They said that they are available to people over 50 and people who are immunocompromised, who've gone at least four months since their last shot. 
there's reasonable evidence from Israel that people who uh, people who had people who over 60 who had a vaccination, especially if it was over four or five months ago, actually have a lower rate of hospitalization and even death if they get a uh, if they get a fourth vaccine. This isn't this isn't um, this isn't um, ironclad data because this was not a randomized trial, and it might be that the people who chose to roll their sleeves up and get a fourth dose were actually a little more cautious too. So. Even if they didn't get a fourth dose, they might have actually had lower rates of infection and hospitalization and and even death. So you know, I think that uh, I think that the evidence is very clear that being vaccinated is better than not being vaccinated, even if you had COVID. The evidence is also very clear that getting a third shot, the booster shot, is way better, especially in this age of Omicron, which is somewhat immune evasive. It's way better to get a third shot than not, than not get a third shot. Once people have had a third shot, the value of a second booster shot is smaller. Um, so from a population perspective, if employers are thinking about the whole population of employees, getting people their first, second, and third shots, those are way more important than a fourth shot. As an individual, though, Cecile, I got my, I'm eligible. I got my fourth shot. Um, I got, I got my second booster shot. Um, you know, I think that, uh, well, the vac- the vaccinations have proven incredibly safe. Uh, it, it looks like so far we've seen immunity that wanes five or six months after people get their last shot. I was at that point. Um, but, you know, again, I think that I think that many individuals will make will make that choice and that will build up our immunity further. And if it turns out that there is in the future a different vaccine, which is more, more attuned to future variants, or if it turns out that we there are that our immunity wanes again, we'll just get another shot at that point. Right. Right. OK. Um, in our, in the spirit of the commitment to expanding our conversation to not just COVID-19, but maybe COVID-19 adjacent topics. I'll ask you about healthcare costs and healthcare costs, like what to expect. We have not only the healthcare environment from the past two years that providers are needing to recover from. We have some supply chain impact um, that is flowing through to providers and hospital systems. What do you see and what do you encourage employers to do as we're in this season, in the spring of 2022, where we're trying to predict what's going to happen in 2023 for healthcare? Uh, I recommend that employers be prepared for an end to relatively low medical inflation. There are a whole lot... A whole lot of things um, coming together, which will mean that 2023 and 2024 will probably be high medical inflation years. So starts out, we have a high rate of general inflation, very high cost of uh, high cost of, of staffing, increased labor costs. Um, we have much more provider consolidation. Weaker providers tend to have failed, and uh, now their patients are going to higher leverage providers, which have higher prices. Um, Specialty drug costs are not going down, and in addition to that, um, the FDA has, has is no longer totally focused on just COVID-19. So there'll be a lot more approvals. Um, pharmaceutical companies are uh, gearing up to be testing things that have nothing to do with the pandemic. We have all that missed preventive and chronic disease care, and uh, you know that mean that might have cost caused savings before, but it will cause higher costs now. There's long COVID. Um, um, and uh, you know there are some promising thoughts about potential therapies for that. Those won't be cheap. There's worsening mental health. Um, and then last of all, the fact that federal funding might be uh, might be diminishing a lot could actually increase employer-sponsored health costs. So, for instance, if if the federal government stops paying for vaccines and testing and therapeutics, those will be uh, those will be employer costs. Even um, looking at a decrease, uh, decrease at the end of this year, unless there's new congressional action in uh, both Medicaid, um, Medicaid as well as uh, um, ex- exchange uh, subsidies, could actually lead some people who would have otherwise chosen again, chosen to not have employer-sponsored health insurance could have them choose to have it and will increase costs. So I think we have to we have to buckle our seatbelts and really be thinking about all the things that we can do to uh, to address this. 
Yep. Um, my, my encouragement to employers is to do a lot of scenario planning, right? Just make sure you've yes. covered your bases in terms of scenarios. All yeah. right. So that was um, a little bit of a downer. So how about if we take a silver lining approach with this next question? Um, there's the adage that necessity is the mother of invention. So I'd love for you to share your thoughts on the innovation that you saw come out of the pandemic. Sure. So let me focus on things that are in the clinical realm. Obviously, the other the really big inno innovation in the workplace is that many of us, um, you and I are both uh, doing this from home. And, uh, um, you know, that 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 is huge. But, you know, there's um, virtual care has been out there for decades, but all of a sudden um, it became real. And we saw a lot of um, traditional bricks and mortars providers actually getting in on offering virtual care and discovering that it's actually much better for patients and much better for uh, for clinicians. The mRNA vaccines are huge. They uh, they are a totally different technolo technologic way to teach the body's immune system to, uh, to, um, to be able to protect one against a disease. And I think there'll be a lot more uses of this in the in the future. Um, we also saw a lot more patient empowerment in terms of you can do your own test. And, uh, you know, in the future, I think that, you know, parents of young children will be doing at-home strep tests. I think that many of us will be do, doing cancer screening tests at home. You know, there'll, there'll be a lot of good things that come from this. Um, even, even much better use of pharmacists. So, you know, pharmacists aren't counting pills now. They're actually uh, they're actually coming out, they're giving vaccines, and I hope that pharmacists in most states will actually be uh, doing tests and prescribing Paxlovid or other effective anti-COVID therapies um, without the intermediate step of having to go into a doctor's office and get an appointment and then come back to the pharmacy to uh, you know to get a uh, to get a prescription. So I, I and you know and then after that we can probably um, expand this to other diseases and there's good evidence that pharmacists are excellent at treating diabetes. We just need to do more of this. Right. Uh, I actually hadn't heard or thought about the pharmacy pharmacist expansion. That's a, a really great point and something for us to probably explore how we can use that channel more effectively. Absolutely. All right. So it is a spring. Do you have a last thought to leave us with before we wrap we, up today? You mentioned the uh, the old saying that necessity is the uh, the, the mother of invention and um, um, actually, you know, disaster is an even bigger mother of invention. So, uh, so clearly, I mean, the COVID pandemic has been a tragedy. We're approaching a million people who have died in the United States alone. There's been, you know, trillions of dollars in economic damage. Hundreds of thousands of children have lost, have lost, uh, have lost a parent or a caretaker. So, I mean, this is an undeniable, terrible tragedy, but I do think we do have to, we do have to learn from this. We have to learn for sure that we we need to be more prepared going forward but um but we also um you know also sometimes if you want to break a log jam um you know not having good alternatives actually makes us learn how to do how to do new things right right well thank you and thanks for your time this month we will see you next time thanks dr jeff great thanks cecile